Hello everyone, welcome to today's event, Landscape Scale Conservation in the Bolivian Amazon, to which, through which we will explore the significant efforts and achievements in landscape scale conservation in the Greater Madidi Tambo Pata landscape and the Llanos de Moxos biocultural landscape guided by the hand of a distinguished expert, Dr. Robert Wallace. I'm Natalie Forrest, Council Member of the Anglo Bolivian Society, and I'll be moderating this session. Following Dr. Wallace's presentation, we will open the floor for questions. Please feel free to submit your questions through the chat and we will address them during the Q&A session. Now I'd like to give the floor to Winston Moore, Chairman of the Anglo-Bolivian Society, who will introduce our speaker. Winston. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Um, welcome, Robert, uh, um, to this presentation. I'd like to uh, just make a brief introduction on your presentation, which is going to be about landscape scale conservation in the Bolivian Amazon. It's the review of 25 years effort towards landscape scale conservation in the Grace Madidi uh, Tambopata landscape and how you fast track lessons learned in the Llanos de Mojos biocultural landscape. I'd just like to add that, you're, <clears throat> that uh, Robert Wallace is a senior conservation scientist and landscape conservation expert for the Wildlife Conservation Society. He's director of the Greater Madidi Tambopata Landscape Conservation Program and the Llanos de Mojos Biocultural Landscape Program. He's the lead editor of the Bolivian Mammal Book, co-author of the Madidi Book, and 320 plus scientific popular articles on South American wildlife and wilderness conservation. He's a National Geographic Explorer, recipient of the 2015 Sidney Anderson Award and the IUCN 2019 Kenton Miller Award for Innovation and Protected Area Management. I would just like to add also that, um, that Dr. Wallace's work within the um, Wildlife Conservation Society includes the leadership of the Identidad Madidi Scientific Ex Expedition between 2015 and 2017, which he received the National Prize for Science and Technology and the Chupiago Marca Award. He has, uh, he has undertaken research on the jaguar, Andean bear, condor, giant otter, and various primates and ungrates in Bolivia. He has also supervised over 40 Bolivian undergraduate and postgraduate theses, and his uh, visiting scholar has been a visiting scholar at the at the School of Forestry and Environment Sciences at the um, Yale University. Added to this, he has, uh, he has been implemented implemented citizen science initiatives with the urban majority population in La Paz and El Alto. I'd like to welcome. Dr. Rob, Robert Wallace to give his presentation. Welcome, Robert. Thank you very much, Winston. And uh, I would very much like to thank um, yourself and, uh, and Natalie, as well as Alberto Subiron and Kate Ford for the invitation to present today. So uh, I will share my screen. Can you can you see my screen now? Yes, it yes, perfectly. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you very much for the invitation. And as uh, as you've indicated, I'm going to speak today a little bit about what we call landscape scale conservation and how we have applied this approach in the Bolivian Amazon, really the Bolivian Andes Amazon, we should say. But uh, but anyway, that is the that is the that is the presentation focus today. And so to begin with, we need to say a little bit about Bolivia, which, of course, uh, as the Anglo-Bolivian society, you all know quite a lot about Bolivia already. Um, but 60 percent of Bolivia is actually within the Amazon basin. Um, and, and when we think about the basin, obviously, that that includes the Andean peaks and the eastern side of, uh, of the entire range of the Andes. And so it's very much a country that has um, extraordinary uh, diversity in terms of different ecosystems, but 60% of those eco ecosystems are in Bolivia. Um, Bolivia is also the 28th largest country in the world, which I always get a, a bit of a kick out of because perhaps we don't think 
uh, of it as, as such a large country, but it is indeed a very large country, almost basically the same size as Peru or Colombia. But it's the country with the 79th largest human population. And when you combine those two pieces of information, it's 230th in the list for countries in terms of human population density. That presents an when we think about conservation, which of course is so important in this 21st century in which we are faced with the dilemma of climate change and other crises related to the environment. How did I end up in Bolivia? Well, that's easy. Uh, I met a young Bolivian woman at university in the UK uh, who was doing her undergraduate degree on biology. I was doing zoology, Lillian Painter, who is the director of WCS, the Wildlife Conservation Society in Bolivia. And um, soon afterwards, I first visited Bolivia in 1989, and the two of us then volunteered for WCS um, between 1990 and 1993 in the Beni and, and, and the northern portion of Santa Cruz department. Um, and we did our PhDs on, in the case of Lillian, on white-lipped peccaries, and um, in my case, on black spider monkeys in Noel Kempf Mercado National Park, which is an extraordinary national park. Um, you know, Venezuela will debate this, but um, potentially the inspiration for Conan Doyle's Lost World. Um, we were there between 1992 and 1998 doing our PhD research and everything that I'm going to present today. I mean, you've invited me. That's brilliant. But it's uh, it's uh, this is a work that uh, that, that that we have uh, that we have we, we have done together um, over the last um, 25 years or so. But not just the two of us, but also a huge team of Bolivian scientists, administrators, communicators, geographers, all sorts of different disciplines. Our team is now uh, about 90 people and myself, and I think there's one other person, a, a Spanish chap who's been living in Bolivia for 30 years too. We're the only two non-Bolivians on the team. And uh, that is something that we are extremely proud of. And the work that uh, I will be presenting today is very much a team effort. And uh, we'll mention that not just WCS, but also all of our local partners, which we'll get to in a minute. So why is conservation so important and most appropriate at the landscape scale? Well, Bolivia is lucky in the sense that uh, we have 23 national parks and they are actually rather large uh, on average. We have quite a lot of rather large protected areas, but protected areas by themselves are rarely large enough to conserve meaningful populations of the most area demanding species. We're gonna to get to them in a minute, but the most area demanding species are often the species that people um, can relate to most and that find most charismatic they typically occur at very low densities and range over very large areas. And so they need very large areas in order to conserve meaningful populations. So that's one reason. Another reason why landscape scale conservation is so important is because many of the most crucial ecosystem functions, when we think about the, the value of nature from the perspective of the, of the functions and the services that it provides us, um, many of those also operate at a landscape scale. And so you can see here on the right, this is the Medidi Tambopatha landscape. Um, it, is, um, it is a transboundary landscape. So uh, the, 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 the sort of right-hand side of it obviously is Bolivia in Northern La Paz department. And the left-hand side is, uh, is Southern Peru. And it is uh, it, there are five different national parks uh, across those two countries that are immediately adjacent, and that's very important. But there are also a number of indigenous territories, which we can see there in the color brown, that are immediately adjacent to or overlap with those national parks, as well as a series of sub-national parks. And you can see that that limit, the landscape limit, has actually been delimited using, um, using uh, a, a watershed approach. And of course, water is one of the main 
crucial ecosystem functions that operates at that scale. It's also important to mention that many of the many of the cultural connections between the indigenous peoples are also relevant at the landscape scale. And more crucially nowadays, the most relevant threats are also operating at that scale. And just to finish off in the more recently, when we think about climate change, operating at this sort of scale is absolutely crucial. So this is a landscape in Northern La Paz that bridges the Andes, the tropical Andes and the Amazon. And that altitudinal gradient, which we'll come to in a minute, um, is absolutely fundamental when we think about how can biodiversity respond to the changes that climate change are, are bringing and, and, and how habitats and ecosystems start pushing up the mountain. So today is, is the day of La Paz. So congratulations <laughs> to all, uh, all of the people who are watching from La Paz or, or originally from La Paz. Felicidades La Paz, is Dia de La Paz. And La Paz has many reasons to be proud, and one of them is Madidi. So in 1999, Lillian and I were asked by WCS to move from Santa Cruz and come to La Paz and begin a landscape scale conservation program based around Madidi National Park. Because Madidi National Park was created in 1995 under the hypothesis that it may be the world's most biolog biologically diverse protected area. And the reason for that is beca because it has an almost 6,000 meter altitudinal gradient. So the highest point in La Paz is a mountain called Chaupiorca, which we can see here on the extreme left of the picture, uh, right on the border with Peru. Uh, that is 6,044 meters. And Medidi has a unique altitudinal gradient that goes down through the different um, ecosystems of the Andes, whether that's the Paramo and Puna and the, and the tree line, um, upper montane forest or cloud forest that we can see here, through the different types of montane forest as we go down the side of the, uh, of the mountain into the Piedmont uh, or, or Andean foothill forests. Here we have the entrance of Medidi on the Beni River, the, the, the Bala Escarpment, and uh, out onto the floodplain. This is actually the Tuichi, the Tuichi River within, within Medidi National Park. And it even has one of the most, um, one of the best conserved pieces of natural, tropical natural grasslands in the Americas on the Heath River, uh, the Pampas de Heath, which um, we'll come to that a little bit later on when we talk about the Llanos de Mojos. So it has this unique altitudinal range with huge ecosystem variety. These are just a few of the habitats that I've pictured here. And so um, one of the first things that we do as an institution is obviously we are the Wildlife Conservation Society. We are in the business of conservation of biodiversity. And so one of the things that we've done is work to try and um, prove that hypothesis that Medidi really is the world's most biologically diverse protected area. And so um, this is actually an initiative called Identidad Medidi, which uh, Winston mentioned. And we, on this initiative, were able to work uh, a young team of Bolivian scientists, visit um, multiple locations across the park and generate information using the most recent technology, we had camera traps, um, Anabat um, recorders, um, uh, audio recorders, um, electrical fissures, etc., to to document the park's biodiversity. And through that, we were able, and and this was a was a cross um, institutional um, effort involving many of Bolivia's most uh, renowned um, institutions. We'll see that um, later on in the presentation. Um, scientific institutions, I should say, um, we were able to uh, increase the plant list for Medidi to, to more than five and a half thousand species within the park boundaries. We doubled the list um, of confirmed vertebrate species that is now approaching 1,900 species. It's, it's about 30 or 40 species off that at the moment. We tripled the butterfly list. There are now 1,836 varieties of butterflies confirmed within the park. 
Um, just to give you an idea, there are 1,035 species of birds confirmed within the park. That's more than anywhere else too. Both butterflies and birds are ahead of anywhere else. Um, and through WCS, uh, over a longer period, we've been able to also increase um, dramatically the number of occurrences, the number of um, vertebrate records that allows us to map the distributions of those species. These efforts also um, increased the number of species for Bolivia overall by 200 species that had not previously been recorded in Bolivia. And we were able to um, identify around 130 species that we believe um, will probably be new species for science. There is a whole process involved in terms of describing those species. And that list actually includes 45 um, vertebrates, mainly fish. Um, so Modidi is super important for biodiversity, but as we can see in this video, it's also a stronghold for many of Latin America's most charismatic and iconic uh, wildlife species. Here we can see three um, spe uh, spectacled bears or Andean bears, a mother and two cubs uh, trying to destroy and successfully actually uh, opening uh, one of the camera traps. Uh, camera traps are something that we use extensively to study wildlife. Uh, this is obviously up in the Elfin Forest on the tree line border with the Paramo, actually in Apolobamba National Park. But we could talk about all sorts of different species because, because um, uh, Madidi is large and has that ecosystem variety. It has um, incredibly important, regionally important stronghold populations for many of Latin America's most charismatic wildlife species. We use an approach uh, called, um, we, we, we select um, landscape species um, transparently in order to guide some of our, uh, uh, when we think about landscape conservation, in order to guide some of our actions, we, um, we select landscape species as a lens with which to, to think about the landscape, in which to, to define different priorities. And so these are some of the landscape species that we use in the greater Madidi Tambopata landscape. We have the maned wolf on the top left, the giant otter, maned wolf in the Pampas de Heath, giant otter obviously in the in the in the lowland Amazonian um, riverine systems, the Andean condor in the, in the Andes, the vicuña of course, uh, on the western portion of the Andes in, within the landscape and uh, the jaguar in, in the Amazonian rainforests. Um, for all of these species, this landscape is a stronghold, a, a proven stronghold for the, for the continent. And uh, these species were actually selectively, uh, the, participatively selected from a list of over 30 candidate species. Um, we then use, I'm not gonna get into this very, in, in very much detail at all, but we use, we generate biological landscapes for those species, um, looking at the landscape through their eyes and intersect that with the human landscape, which is where people are and where different activities are taking place. And that's how we identify priority areas and the key threats with which to then construct what we call a conservation landscape. So this side of the of the theoretical approach allows us to identify where are the priorities to, to act in a given landscape. And then we use another tool, which is now widely accepted within the open standards for conservation on a global basis called conceptual models. When we started using it, it was not widely um, used, but it is now in which on the basis of those threats and our conservation objectives, we're then able to design inter interventions or conservation actions to, to either address the contributing factors that are affecting threats or, um, or promoting threats or the threats themselves. And so that, that is very, very simply how we, we go about building our priorities. And then we obviously in the field are applying those conservation actions. So. I'm going to be very briefly now give you an idea about what we have been doing with the different local actors. 
On the left hand side of this slide, you can see a number of logos that represent the national protected areas with whom we work and, of course, the, the National Protected Area Service. They are, of course, a key partner for us in Bolivia, as well as uh, many different indigenous organiza organizations that you can see there representing the Lecos people, the Takana people, the Chimani Moseten people, the indigenous people of Northern La Paz in general, and also the, the, the Pukina people in, in, um, in Apolo Bamba. On the map here, you can see some of those here. Are the, this is where the Pukina are, the Lecos, Chimani Moseten, Takanas, etc. And so over the last 25 years, our approach has really been partnering with those two good groups of actors. So if we think about the protected areas, um, we have, we've been supporting them for 25 years, we currently have funding from the Legacy Landscape Fund, uh, an initiative uh, from the German government, and also um, with, with support from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation to continue these actions. And very briefly, you can see on this slide the different types of um, support that we provide. Obviously, the park guards um, are, are one of our prime um, partners and, and for many of us working in conservation, our heroes. Um, we work with them in terms of thinking about management plans, protection and control and vigilance plans, as well as monitoring, uh, integrated monitoring approaches and uh, environmental action plans. With them also, uh, we, we've also worked um, very, uh, very intensively uh, with the Bolivian government designing and helping to implement uh, park guard training programs such that they are recognized with university um, uh, level uh, degrees. Uh, obviously, we also assist the protected area service and the protected areas in their approaches to social participation, which has been, Bolivia has been a world leader on that 25 years ago, 30 years ago, when the, when the protected area systems were being created, Bolivia's approach to social participation was really groundbreaking. Everyone else is catching up now, but that's still a key part of um, protected area management in Bolivia. We are also working, obviously, with them on, is on the issues of sustainable finance, which is so crucial for all conservation action, not just in protected areas. And then we work on things like natural resource management and tourism, which we're going to get to in a minute anyway. Similarly, with indigenous territories, we also work um, uh, intensively uh, to help the, the, the indigenous organizations that I've mentioned um, to uh, to think about uh, indigenous territorial management as a conservation strategy. Um, we accompany them, we partner them from a technical and financial perspective in a whole series of actions. These 10 that we have uh, indicated here, I'm not going to read them all out, but they are the key steps in terms of building indigenous territorial management and in fact, together with those organizations, and in fact, actually also some of our other um, partners in Peru and Ecuador, with the Peruvian and Ecuadorian WCS teams, we have been able to then systematize this approach, which has been very successful, um, recognizing these different steps within uh, 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 a toolbox for indigenous, ter indigenous territorial management, which we've shared more broadly. And this is the toolbox here. Um, I'm not going to go in and, and show you all, but it, 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 I would encourage anyone who's particularly interested in this aspect to go and check it out. It's really, really super in which for each of those steps, there are a bunch of methodologies um, developed that uh, different indigenous organizations and other actors can then draw on those to design their own, their own uh, methodologies. But I think it's really important to stress here that from our perspective, conservation has to be built from the bottom up. That is our way. And it, this approach has been highly successful here. We have the Takana people, for example, receiving an Equator Prize from the UN um, um, for in recognition of massively decreased deforestation within their indigenous territory as compared to areas outside it. Very similarly, um, the Chimani Moseten people have also received um, an Equator Prize for their contributions towards conservation too. The indigenous people on many different occasions have been 
the greatest defenders of the national parks and the environment and the natural world in, in the landscapes where we work and we salute them. In that sense, Lillian has been very much involved more recently in developing uh, a sustainable finance fund, uh, which is being implemented by Fundisnap, um, the foundation for the de development of uh, and sustainable uh, finance of protected areas. But they have branched out into assisting indigenous territories and indigenous organizations in uh, the design of a, a, a dedicated um, a sinking fund for um, indigenous territorial management. And that's something that I know we will be looking to increase over the over the coming over the coming months and years because indigenous territorial management also requires um, sustainable funding and that's one of the great challenges um, at, at the moment in it, we have also more recently um, moved into two more areas which are really crucial and have to do more with culture on the one hand helping the indigenous people document um, not just their 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 very much alive uh, current culture, but also helping them document archaeological sites um, in the indigenous territories uh, and and visiting, for example, very recently a commission of of Takana people went to visit museums um, in Sweden and Germany to look at collections made almost a century ago um, and 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 document those those artifacts. Um, in the same way, we are very much convinced that it is absolutely crucial to engage more, more intensively with Indigenous youth. They are the future. They are the future leadership. And so we are very much involved in assisting the Indigenous organisations in engaging with their youth and looking to develop leadership capacity with young people in the indig Indigenous territories. A big piece of all of this, when we think about you know, I haven't even mentioned life plans, um, which is a big piece of what we what we've helped the indigenous people um, do, which is basically develop a vision for the management of their territories, not just assisting them um, in the crucial legal um, stages in terms of establishing their territories, but then also helping them develop and put down on paper their vision for the management of that unit. That's something that we spent an awful lot of time on. Um, but when it comes down to it, implementing those life plans often focus and center on building um, different livelihood options for indigenous people. And so at any time at the moment, WCS and for the last over the last 10 years and more, we've been supporting over 100 communities in helping them develop their priority sustainable natural resource management projects. Um, and those very range from from efforts to that that, that involve shearing um, sustainably every two years vicuña populations, wild vicuña populations, for example, in Apolobamba, um, harvesting spectacle caiman uh, for skins and meat, with um, population surveys and guarantees that it is sustainable, developing uh, and producing wild chocolate, um, wild chocolate is not as abundant as as the sort of um the sort of um, farmed chocolate but it's uh, but it's much higher quality and obviously is is um is also extremely interesting in terms of its its value to the forest similarly we have supported many different communities in their efforts to develop shade grown coffee high quality co coffee grown in shade grown agroforestry plots which allow um a proliferation of um, biodiversity, including well over 230 species of birds, for example, in one of the efforts that we support. Um, handicrafts, essential oils, um, vanilla production, ecotourism, helping families in their household gardens, working with fisher people in terms of um, their commercial fishing efforts and incense collection in the montane forests and, and many other different initiatives. Um, we could do a presentation on any one of those, but um, very briefly, um, for example, the Medidi Pampas tourism destination has now been recognized as a top 100 green destination in the world, and tourism levels are recovering to pre-COVID levels, we're happy to report, this year and last year. 
The Cayman harvest, for example, has been recognized um, and, and encouraged legal changes to recognize those community efforts and the sustainability of the initiative. Um, that, 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 that harvest you can now buy in, in supermarkets as well as in some of Bolivia's most, um, most um, uh, um, important restaurants. Uh, the, 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 the wild chocolate and the coffee has been recognized internationally at the Salon de, de, Cho de Chocolat and, and with prize winning, winning coffee um, too. And some of the people who are working from the families are now considered experts in, in terms of um, coffee evaluation. Um, and more importantly, you know, this is actually the coffee that I was talking about, Echo de las Aves, where you, you can, you can, it's commercially available here in La Paz, and you can drink coffee and know you're contributing to conservation. And here we have a, a group of people involved, uh, uh, mainly ladies actually there, working in, in towards the Vicuña um, capture in the in, in Apollo Bamba. But you can see here some of the economic impacts that these these initiatives are having, right? So we have massive increases in income to the people involved in these initiatives. And uh, these are just some of the examples that we wanted to share. So you can see there a 60% increase and quite a considerable over $400,000 um, for the coffee producers in 2023, almost $10,000 for, for, the, for the wild chocolate producers and uh, well over $200,000 for the, the people involved in the Vicuña um, shearing, which is an activity that takes just one week every year of their time. This is important because for any given community, there is no silver bullet. So this is a, a is a really beautiful um, um, graphic which we produced with the Takana people to represent their kind of production calendar. And what it shows is that each community really needs a variety of natural resource management projects. And so it takes time to build that capacity with these different actors. But you can see here, one of the things we did was with the Takana people, we actually did economic surveys, socioeconomic surveys, and quantified that their income increased by 93% uh, in, in the households participating in the different natural resource management projects that the Takana people are involved with. So this approach works. It's bottom-up conservation. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes commitment. But we know that it works. And one of the reasons that we know that it works is because we have also been monitoring some of those landscape species that I mentioned at, at the beginning. Um, I could talk about all sorts of different things. We can look here. This is actually information. If we look on the top right there, that's a graph um, showing jaguar population density in the Tuichiondo within Madidi National Park. It's an area that is not just um, Madidi National Park. It overlaps with three indigenous territories as well. And so collectively, the conservation of the park and the ecotourism commitment and the vision of the, of the indigenous people, those three factors have actually led to the, the recovery of jaguar populations that you can see here. The last data point is very worrying because the population has gone down last year, but I would very much like to stress here that we kind of know why that is. And it's not because there's any impact there in, in any way. It's because white lip peccaries, which are the principal prey species for jaguars, they left, they migrated. And if you ask me why, well, that's something we have to admit that we don't fully understand yet. And that's one of the amazing things about the Amazon. We're finding stuff out all the time. We did hear last week that uh, some peccaries were making their way back into that valley, and we fully expect in time for the jaguars to recover. But overall, those are very high densities, particularly between 2012 and 2019. Those are some of the highest jaguar densities reported anywhere. And it shows the effectiveness of the management of the park, the commitment of the indigenous people, and also the activities of ecotourism. In the same way, we have data from those sites and others for other species that I've listed here. I'm not going to get into the details of that. We've also got information that demonstrates quite clearly that northern La Paz is a stronghold and Andean bear populations are still in good shape. Uh, we've, we're also working with m more technology, like, for example, environmental DNA. Um, identifying the spawning areas for threatened catfish and Madidi is definitely uh, an area for, for that. 
And we've also performed uh, pioneering long-term studies on uh, primates and Andean condors, um, for example. Here we have another video, which uh, I know you'll all enjoy. Um, so as I, as I, you know, this is a jaguar mother on the Ondo River with two cubs. And it's this kind of thing that, that uh, this, this monitoring data, which allows us to evaluate the effectiveness of the, 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 on the one hand, the protected areas and the, and the government agencies that, that manage them, uh, but also, um, as I've mentioned, the indigenous people. So very quickly, I wanted to move on and talk very briefly about a second landscape, because what we did is um, we've worked in the Beni for 25 years, but about uh, four or five years ago, we decided that we needed to formalize that and actually think about a second landscape. This map that we're looking at here is a map of the Amazon Basin. Um, if you look, this is what it's doing, is highlighting the um, aquatic areas, the wetlands, of the Amazon Basin. And as you can see there, the biggest one just sits there here in Bolivia. That those that that big pink uh, spot here uh, is the are the Llanos de Mojos in the Beni department. And as you can see, it's the largest wetland in the Amazon. And so that means it's really, really important for the hydrology of the Amazon overall. It sits within the Madeira Basin, which is the one of the main tributaries of the Amazon. It's actually the largest of the main tributaries of the Amazon, making up 19%. But really amazingly, the Madeira, whilst being 19% of the Amazon Basin in area, it carries around roughly 50% of the sediments, which makes it absolutely crucial for the entire ecology of the Amazon Basin. And so this is an area that we really wanted to prioritize and so we have developed a second landscape um, in the Llanos de Mojos of the Beni. It extends somewhat into northern Santa Cruz, but at the moment our actions are pretty much exclusively in the Beni. Here you can see some of the protected areas in green and the indigenous lands that uh, overlap. So you can see that it's a very similar situation to what I've already shared from Madidi Tambopata. And so we wanted to see how we could share those experiences across this area and fast track them. So one of the first things we did, this is something uh, that, uh, that uh, I work on with Zulem Alem, um, who's based in Trinidad. We have an office now in Trinidad, uh, as well as La Paz. And the, what we did initially was actually work with a bunch of organizations, Bolivian organizations and international organizations who were really interested in the Llanos de Mojos to develop what we call the Llanos de Mojos Working Group or in Spanish, El Grupo de Trabajo de, para los Llanos de Mojos, uh, which is made up of organizations, people, donors, academics, etc., who are committed to generating knowledge and, uh, and, and, and assisting and promoting sustainable development and conservation in this area. Um, so WCS, in, in, together with the, with the Moore Foundation, and as you can see he, here, I'm not gonna read them all out just from a time perspective, but a number of, of very important Bolivian organizations who are committed to conservation, as well as some uh, international universities. The Llanos de Mojos, we call it a bi biocultural landscape. Um, because it's just it's 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 so fundamental this relationship between on the one hand protected areas it's an area that is very underrepresented in terms of national protected areas but it has a lot of subnational protected areas both departmental and municipal and so you have well over almost getting towards 8 million hectares of uh, of 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 this area that has that is um within 22 national protected areas, another almost 6 million hectares within 18 different indigenous territories. Important to mention here that the Llanos de Mojos have half of the indigenous peoples present that are present in Bolivia in, in this department. It's incredibly important. It's also a linguistic, um, recognized global linguistic diversity site. It also, if we look here on the bottom right, we have a map that we've developed the, with the Grupo de Trabajo para los Llanos de Mojos of the archaeological sites in the Llanos de Mojos. The Llanos de Mojos, quite simply, may be the most important archaeological region in South America. It has an incredible 
concentration and diversity of archaeological sites. There's been a lot of work over the last few years, particularly by the University of Bonn, who is part of one of the members, to look at this and to map this out and to actually start um, doing major digs to, to document this. But it's incredibly important uh, site and it has... And it shows that, 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 that this place has been a biocultural landscape for 10,000 years. Yucca was domesticated here about 9,000 years ago. And then finally, on the left-hand side, it's also important to recognize that there are three enormous Ramsar sites, which are sites dedicated towards um, looking towards conservation of wetlands. And so uh, about a decade ago, the Bolivian government um, um, uh, declared these three enormous um, Ramsar sites, which are three of the biggest sites internationally for the for the International Convention on, on, Rams, on Ramsar sites anywhere. We've also selected a number of landscape species um, for the, the Llanos de Mojos. Some of them are the same as the ones in, in, in Mariri Tambopata, but there are many others that are that are very much different that respond to the to the priorities of this landscape. Um, and it's important because we need to start thinking about threats. Um, we have to recognize a lot of people think about cattle as a threat. That may be the case, but we have to understand that this is a natural grassland and cattle produced here are not actually um, resulting in deforestation. And what we have to think about is how can we promote um, cattle, uh, reduced impact cattle production as an alternative for things like mechanized agriculture, which would be a lot worse for um, this landscape. Um, obviously, that in and of itself, there are a number of threats that we need to think about right now, including fire, including um, traffic, uh, wildlife trafficking, and the expansion of mining activities, which of course is also extremely relevant for the Madidi landscape. And so I'm not gonna read all this out um, because I'm aware of the fact that I'm, I'm pushing uh, the, the time boundary. Um, and uh, there is something else I want to share, um, but this is very much this list of activities that we uh, are, are engaged with in the in this landscape since 2020. Um, this project, this landscape, was born during the during the pandemic, um, and so it's very much desk based for the first year. But we are now um, heavily implementing in, in this landscape in conjunction with those institutions that I mentioned. And of course, all of the, the local actors, the municipal protected areas, national protected areas, indigenous organizations and communities. But you can see here that we're basically using that same approach, bottom up conservation, working with local actors, sustainable livelihoods and generating information about wildlife and biodiversity and sharing that with um, people. Um, when we think about landscape conservation, we have to also understand that there are transformative threats. There are things like fires that Bolivia has been suffering and mining, which uh, is, is, is a particularly worrying and concerning threat at the moment. Both of these we are working with the national government, with local actors and other actors in terms of how can we address those. Um, but I wanted to mention it because landscape conservation is also dynamic. The map and the, and the nature of the threats that we have been addressing over the last 25 years has been constantly changing. A really good example of that is uh, wildlife traffic. So in the 1970s, the CITES legislation in combination with the implementation of a number of national protected areas in Bolivia and beyond, actually meant that, as we could see in that graph that I showed earlier, jaguar traffic uh, and jaguar populations, jaguar traffic was, uh, was very much reduced because before that in the 40s to 60s, there was traffic for skins. But after, but subsequently, that, that died down because of CITES, the Convention on International Trade of Endangered Species, as well as the implement, implementation of national protected areas, basically reduced that. But we detected in um, 2014 a new threat, which came from the interest in Jaguar. Instead of skins, the trade was mainly in uh, Jaguar fangs that you can see here in this picture. 
This is a package seized in the Bolivian postal system, which was on its way to, in this case, China with uh, Jaguar fangs. Um, and so we have developed a whole uh, department basically to looking to assist the Bolivian government and the Bolivian actors in addressing this threat. Um, and, and you can see here some of the statistics that we've been able to do by systematizing information. We also have a whole range of um, training and capacity building and, and, um, and, uh, and research and investigation on this. But you can see that many of the events that were Jaguar events within this national database of all uh, illegal wildlife trafficking events were actually um, linked to, to the problem of uh, a demand for these fangs in Asia, particularly China, not exclusively though. And so um, this is something that we've had to had to develop over the last decade, for example, as an example of how um, of how these 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 threats are dynamic. Um, and so, when we think about those kinds of threats, it's really important those transformative threats and the dynamic nature of the threats that we also think about how can we contribute towards policy. And um, here, because of time, I'm not going to go into the details of any of these. In fact, I'm not even going to read them out. But you can see here a huge range of initiatives in which we have been invited by different um, actors within the Bolivian government and actually beyond to um, assist in the development of policy to address some of the threats that we've been mentioning and ensure the conservation of different species, perhaps the most um, the most recent and the most emblematic is the Andean Condor Law, which was passed at the end of last year. It was something that was born out of a disaster in which many condors were poisoned in southern Bolivia. And as a result of that, and in reference to the action plan that we would helped the Bolivian government develop, and also uh, a regional priority setting exercise that I was able to help lead, um, the Bolivian government decided to develop a law which actually includes some 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 clauses which are extremely relevant for all Bolivian wildlife because it bans the poisoning of wildlife, it bans the illegal trade of wildlife, and punishes them both with um, with significant penal um, uh, um, um, I can't I can't think of the word, but but basically sent prison sentences as well as fires in protected areas similarly um this is something that lillian has been leading um uh basically we have assisted the bolivian government in a process to look to see how bolivia could respond to the 30 by 30 initiative which is a global initiative to try and get 30 percent of um, the world under protection by 2030. That's what 30 by 30 is. The good news is that between the national protected areas, the municipal protected areas, the Ramsar sites and the indigenous territories of Bolivia, we're actually already at 57%. And so the challenge then becomes, how do we make that sustainable? And Lillian is working with the government to look to see how we can develop sustainable financing mechanisms based on this prioritization which is also as we can see below in good conservation state and is also able to protect most of the priority species and is extremely well connected and so bolivia is 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 doing well on this and and the challenge as i say underline and stress is to how do we build sustainable finance mechanisms for this and just to to end this piece and i'm going to ask for five minutes more is is that everything that I've just shared is hugely relevant for the Amazon itself. This is a map that I really like. I couldn't find the most recent version, but this is, it doesn't matter. This map shows protected areas in green and indigenous territories in orange. And what you can see is that the Amazon basin is actually pretty, that, that, that sort of pattern of overlapping and immediately adjacent protected areas and indigenous territories, what we can see what we've seen in the Medidi Tambopata landscape and the Llanos de Mojos landscape is actually very typical of the Amazon basin itself. And so this um, approach, this landscape scale appro approach to conservation is extremely relevant if we could then roll this out and, 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 and share lessons learned 
across the board for the entire Amazon basin. The good news is that the Amazon basin between protected areas and indigenous territories, there's already about 50% designated. The bad news is that those areas need help in terms of how do we sustainably finance them into the future. Not necessarily bad news, but that's that's the real challenge. And finally, I wanted to share something that I'm very passionate about and that basically is something that we've learned over the years. About a decade ago, possibly a little bit more, we realized that whilst the bread and butter and that major emphasis of our approach to conservation will always be with local people in those in those incredible landscapes. The, it's also extremely important that we begin thinking about how can we connect with the majority? Because the majority of people in Bolivia, 70% now live in cities. Uh, this is of course La Paz on the day of La Paz, Felicidad is again. Um, but, uh, but we could say, you know, we could, we could talk about any other country in the world and urbanization is, is, uh, it, 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 it is in fact, actually Bolivia is an outlier in, in Latin America. Latin America is actually the region with the most, uh, the greatest portion of people living in cities, 80%. And so more and more people are living in cities and, as we move into a technological world, we need to think about how do we connect with those people? How do we ensure that they value nature? How do they? How do we make sure that they are engaged with conservation efforts in these extraordinary places? And so we have actually began thinking about that. It's really important because, you know, yes, of course, uh, I can report that, uh, I can confirm that there are actually no bison in Bolivia. But you all knew that that was a bison, right? Whereas, how many of you know what that is? Because this is this is basically Bolivia's equivalent to a bison. It's a marsh deer, an absolutely extraordinary animal, huge, fantastic animal that lives in the natural grasslands of the Llanos de Mojos and the Pampas de Heath. But I bet many of you didn't know what that was. And so a major challenge that we've seen is how can we change that? How can we... How can we use communication and education, environmental education, to get people more engaged with their own nature in Bolivia? Because it can't be that everyone knows what a polar bear is, an elephant is, a giraffe is, and a bison is, but they don't know what a marsh deer or a tapir or a or a peccary is. And so we've done a number of things. This is this is these are some exhibitions, photographic exhibitions that we did in the in the Ethno Folkloric Museum here in La Paz which were extremely popular about Medidi, which we were sharing high quality photographs and information about Bolivian biodiversity. One of the highlights, I would say, of, of the whole time in the last 25 years was being there that night and listening to people say, this isn't in Bolivia, is it? Yes, it is, really? And people getting super excited, as you can see in this, in this, in this photograph. I've already talked about Identidad Medidi. That was, many people think that that was Rob trying to go back to the field and be a scientist, but really it was a, it was actually born and designed as a communication campaign together with all these different institutions here, major scientific institutions that I didn't mention earlier that were part of this um, inter-institutional platform, of course, of, as well with Medidi National Park and the Protected Area Service and the Ministry of, of the Environment and Water too. But, but basically it was, it was the whole point of that was on the one hand to generate scientific information, but really it was about communicating the importance of Medidi to the Bolivian people because most people had no idea that the world's most biologically diverse protected area is in Bolivia. And so we hope that uh, this initiative helped to change that. Similarly, and I have nearly finished, I promise, um, we have worked with the Gusto restaurant, which is La Paz's um, best restaurant, according to the 50 best restaurants in, in Latin America, um, and Bolivia's best restaurant. We've worked with them on an initiative called Sabores Silvestres. The idea here is on the one hand, we need to engage with that urban audience a really good way of engaging engaging with them is 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 telling them about community based natural resource management initiatives that are producing high quality fantastic food stuffs but that really desperately need a helping hand in terms of market because 
those communities are by definition isolated and so far and so and though and therefore up against it in terms of um their market opportunities and so we need markets that are willing to recognize the full value of these resources not just that they're really good quality resources not that they're just novel resources in many cases but also that they have a whole conservation and cultural history and, and story behind them and that's the real value and so we are very much committed with gusto to exploring this further and helping to develop those markets through the participation of chefs and the development of um, projects that recognize the integral value of these different products. And finally, um, to end, um, the last thing that we've done is think about the think about citizen science as a tool to with which to engage people in cities with nature. And I cannot congratulate La Paz enough today on the day of La Paz for their extraordinary participation in the City Nature Challenge over the last uh, five, six years. We first participated in 2019. Uh, we had to pause during the pandemic for obvious reasons. But in 2022, 23, 24, we smashed the, West, the rest of the world. La Paz finished top in all three categories, observation, species, and participants in this year's edition, beating off 690 other cities uh, worldwide in a citizen science challenge in which you use your mobile phone or your cameras to register biodiversity within and around the city over four days. Um, you know, we beat, we can see here, um, Cape Town, Dallas, Hong Kong, uh, San Francisco, Los Angeles, New York, London, Paris, um, all sorts of different cities, Buenos Aires, Sao Paulo, Lima. La Paz is the city for the last three years that has won. We are three campeones, and, um, <laughs> and it really is a, a, a demonstration of La Paz's uh, commitment towards uh, uh, nature and their interest in nature in a city which doesn't have a lot of green spaces within it, but around it has an extraordinary diversity. And here we can see... Um, some of the participants over the last uh, four or five years. And amazingly, in 2024, we had three Bolivian cities in the top five cities world, uh, worldwide. La Paz at the top, but you can see there in fourth and fifth place, Cochabamba and Trinidad. And uh, in terms of observations and in terms of people, little Trinidad, just 130,000 people but almost 2,000 of them participating in this City Nature Challenge. As a percentage of the population, they absolutely smashed everywhere else. And so <laughs> this is another demonstration of Bolivia's um, commitment and interest in nature. And that's something that we would very much like to continue to um, develop activities to promote that. And so with that, I will end. Thank you very much. Um, it's been a pleasure, and I, I know I've overrun a little bit, but uh, unfortunately, uh, such is the way. <laughs> Thank you so much, Robert. Great, great information. Uh, we're really happy to know uh, everything you discovered while you were living here in La Paz <laughs> and with, with, uh, during your projects. I didn't know we had uh, that variety and diversity, and it, that it was so important. I knew we had interest and diversity in this side of La Paz, but that it was so global, I didn't know that. And I think that everyone who was listening to your, your presentation uh, was also blown away, surprised. Now we are ready for questions and, questions and answers, and we have already two. Um, um, this is from Natalie Camargo. She said, um, well, she deeply appreciates your work and education in this field and his, uh, her questions. What guidance and advice can you offer to future generations of professionals dedicated to science and conservation, especially in challenging and critical contexts, such as those faced by the Bolivian Amazon? We lack job opportunities and the option to apply our initiatives in communication and in, in 
education. Additionally, how can you scientists and conservationists contribute more effectively to biodiversity conservation and sustainable natural resource management in our region? Yeah, thank you very much, Natalie, for the question. It's a it's a really important question. Um, it's something that um, that we are very much um, committed to. And so on the one hand, over the years, Winston mentioned it, but WCS more generally has has, has been very much um, supportive of the idea of supporting young Bolivian scientists um, in the development of their undergraduate and postgraduate theses. Um, I personally uh, feel that it is important for people who want to work in conservation to go to the field. And, and we need to think about ways that we can do that. Um, I know, for example, that um, in La Paz, it's currently in the, at least in some of the universities in La Paz, it's currently a lot more difficult to find students that can that that are able to go to the field within the framework of their university commitments, um, and so, you know, we are beginning to explore um, um, the possibility of working with other universities to try and address that. But we also need to think about how to perhaps facilitate other mechanisms mechanisms in which young Bolivian professionals can get to the field, whether that's through more, um, more extensive and intensive field courses. That's one, that's one way of, of, of doing that. I think, you know, it's very easy. Um, it, it's very easy to say, it's not necessarily that easy to do. Um, but I do think that the, that, that, that the young people who wanna, wanna get involved can also think about volunteering Sometimes you can volunteer for extended per periods. Sometimes that isn't possible because the, of the situation that the person is in. But they can still volunteer on a, you know, on a weekly basis, um, a few hours. I think it's important to engage. If that's some, if this is something that young people are interested in, I do think that the earlier that you can engage and get involved in these in these initiatives, the better. Um, and I can't stress enough that, you know, if you look at it, there is a scenario, yes, Bolivia, and we hear about it all the time, Bolivia and the Amazon and the world is facing an incredible amount of challenges. And I do think obviously those, it's very important for that information to be out there and the people who are developing that information and are reporting that, I congratulate them. But I also think it's super important that we also remember that there are positives. There are positive stories out there. You know, a lot of people um, question what's happening in the Amazon. And it, I, 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 as you know, I am from the UK. I go, I go back to the UK occasionally, and it always frustrates me that everyone thinks that you know the Amazon is just one big disaster story. And it's like, well, name me another region in the world with that amount of forest where 50% of it has already been designated by the governments as, e as either indigenous territory or, or protected area. Oh, that's right. There isn't another place that's done that. So yes, there are challenges. Yes, those areas need sustainable finance, as I've stressed three or four times in the presentation. But the commitment of the, of the governments and the interest of the people, as I've just shown, for example, in the City Nature Challenge, it's there. It's just how do we how do we channel that? And I think another thing I would say is I would really encourage young people to, to think creatively about how they can engage with people. Because we see these things, we, you know, some of those initiatives that I've shared at the end there, they were just they started off as harebrained ideas, but they worked, right? Not everything that we've tried has worked. But lots of things that we've tried have worked. I didn't share here a recent thing, for example, where people from the landscape, from the Medidi landscape, have made their own films using telephones uh, and shared it with the Voces del Madidi. That's another website. That if you look up Voces del Madidi, it's super interesting. Park guards, local indigenous people documenting 
um, and interviewing people and documenting issues. I think we have to be way more creative. And I think that's something that I would strongly encourage young people to think about. You're we on. can't hear you, Natalie. You're on. You're mute. We have another question, anonymous attendee. How does one contribute to these efforts from abroad? Um, well, there are a number of ways. One way, of course, is by is by is you know pe people can fund conservation initiatives from abroad, of course. But also people can visit and people can talk about, um, you know, I can see that the next question has to do with international tourism. So I'm going to link yes. that in. Mm -hmm. I think international tourism, if you ask me, if you've asked me 20 years ago, it was clear to me that one of Bolivia's enormous potentials is tourism. Because it's a country that is spectacularly beautiful, that has incredibly engaging and diverse and wonderful and beautiful people and then on top of that it just has this amazing amazing biodiversity and so i think that is something that really is you know it, it, it's it's it, it's bolivia's great great quality and strength and it could easily be channeled into into a tourism into a into a tourism sort of focused country um yes it's isolated but that's part of the reason why bolivia is the way it is is because it's isolated and that's and that is that's something that we should draw on um and so i think tourism is definitely part of the answer but i would very much strongly recommend that we also think about national tourism one of the interesting things about, about the pandemic was that because people weren't able to travel internationally, lots of people who hadn't previously maybe thought about visiting some of the protected areas in Bolivia started to do so during the pandemic and actually kept some of the tourism businesses alive. They're now recovering with international tourism, but but that's that's super interesting. We need to we need to think about how can we promote that kind of culture of visiting national 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 parks indigenous territories wild places so that we can we can we can on the one hand support those communities and uh local businesses that are in, that are engaged in that in that activity but on the other hand contribute towards the sustainable finance of those areas so i think i think that would be a really important way to do that Do we have more questions? Oh, we have another one requesting uh, uh, if you, WCS is open to partnership with local private organizations for all private activities. I think you would uh, you could answer that uh, in private if you want. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't talk mm -hmm. about it very much. Um, I, I perhaps would, you know, I, I for, for sure. I mean, obviously, when it when it comes to any kind of natural resource, um, what we're looking for uh, first and foremost is is to ensure the sustainability of that um, of that potential harvest. And and fortunately, the 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 particularly the indigenous organisations, but actually local people in general are very much interested in that. So, for example, the coffee producers, the ones that are producing the bird friendly coffee, the only certified bird friendly coffee in Bolivia. Echo de las Aves, they are not indigenous people, but they are very much committed to the sustainability of their activity. Um, they've registered 200 and almost 240 species of birds in their coffee plots. Um, and so, you know, and just recently, actually, we, we published a paper two weeks ago that documents the first ever record for a, 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 the Amazon weasel, uh, never previously reported in Bolivia. Um, and that was actually a video that was filmed by one of the coffee producers. So it's another example of citizen science. So, so we are interested in sustainability first and foremost, um, but we are very much engaged with private actors. So on the one hand, 
um, I would like to take this opportunity just to say that from the pr perspective of, of certified beef in the Llanos de Mojos, we are absolutely convinced that there is a pathway towards thinking about and, and developing a, a wildlife friendly or reduced impact certification of cattle, of beef production. And, and obviously beef production and cattle ranching in the Llanos de Mojos is, is perhaps the main economic activity right now. And so the question is, how can we uh, work with the ranchers to develop, um, to, uh, to basically assist them in developing a suite of criteria that they could use to then certify um, their beef by demonstrating reduced impact um, cattle ranching, thinking about how they manage water, how they manage fire, what their policy is towards wildlife and biodiversity on their ranches. Many of them are already doing this. That's the interesting thing. And so it's actually really facilitating them to get together and share their experiences and then hammer out together uh, a, a series of criteria with which to do that. Wonderful. And um, you have mentioned how uh, important are indigenous communities for all these conservation projects. So uh, what policy measures could support and expand these community-led efforts? That Sorry. question is mine. Can you repeat <laughs> that? Sorry, because I was... You mentioned I... uh, that indigenous communities are essential uh, for all these uh, conservation projects. So uh, what policy measures could support and expand these communities-led efforts? Well, I, yeah, I, I didn't go into the details of that on the policy intervention, but for example, we've worked with different indigenous organizations in terms of, um, you know, having them being recognized as a sort of um, economic, um, basically having a, a status that allows them that recognizes the contributions that they're making and allows them to sort of have a different um, tax um, uh, uh, sort of um, uh, status um, because they're already contributing in different ways, right? So if they're conserving the forest, they're conserving the water, they're sustainably harvesting, they're, sus they're, they're conserving the biodiversity and wildlife, they're already making a contribution. And so it's basically how do you you get that recognized i think that was that's something that we have been working through through the oecas which is sort of community-based economic organizations but also you know you could think about further economic steps towards that i think also like um thinking about how you know policies that would allow us that would recognize the importance of thinking about certifying products as being wildlife friendly and 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 also perhaps um, you know, not just wildlife friendly, but also, you know, contributing towards the sustainable livelihoods of indigenous people. I think, I think those are the sorts of things that we need to think about into the future, definitely. Do we have more questions? I have a question. Winston. Yes, yes. please, Winston. I, um, Robert, well, that was a, an incredible uh, presentation. It was, um, I think you took us um, beyond the looking glass. You 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 enabled us to get into this sort of um, uh, into this other world, yeah, which has been incredible. You took us beyond the looking glass as an Alice in Wonderland, and it's a it's a world that's very colorful that we don't understand. It. There are many dimensions to it, but you gave us a glimpse of that, and it, what it means it'll it'll offer us an opportunity to begin exploring that going into that world and finding out what it's about. I have a question for you, a motto. If you, does it mean anything to you? No reward without effort. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, it, it, the, the challenge that we have as conservationists is, is that everything is very urgent um, and, and the demands and the priorities are, are vast, right? So on the one hand, you have that, but the it is important to recognize that, that these things do take time. So, you know, we have tried to fast track a lot of what we've learned into the Llanos de Mojos um, biocultural landscape. And I, I really believe that we've been 
We've been incredibly successful in doing that, in, in fast tracking what we've learned. Um, and that gives me great hope because I think, you know, that would that means that that in theory, um, you know, we could do that beyond. And so I think we have to also, you know, sometimes there's that other there's that other phrase that the the urgent always, always <laughs> overrides the important. And so what we have been trying to do as an organization and as as a group of of, of sort of, you know, professionals is to think about how can we actually make some time to make sure that we can get the important over the line. And, and for us, the important are those sort of those sort of lessons learned sharing mechanisms. For example, the the the, the indigenous territory management um, tool that, that we've done is one example, for example, um, that we we really wanted to 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 get that over the line so that we can share these lessons. And it's why, you know, we, we're always very keen to to engage with society at a broader level, like for example today, but also in other in other scenarios, because because it is important. And and I and I and I, and I think we have to recognize that it takes effort, but on the other hand, we have to recognize that this is this is absolutely crucial for the future of the planet, for the future of the human race. Without getting too dramatic, it's it's certainly the case. And um, and I go back to what I said earlier. There is a lot of negative messaging about this, and that is fine. That's OK. But we need to balance that with the fact that there are actually examples and there are actually good news stories and there are reasons to be hopeful. And so. I hope that I've got that across today. I, I just wanted to add regarding that motto. That's the motto of your school. Ah. Yes, <laughs> Catherine Lady Berkeley School in Wooten Under Edge, where you did your I, studies. They are and I bring it to you as a memory. Yeah, <laughs> as a memory, because you made repeated references to effort. And yeah. I think that is part of your heritage. So I was a little bit cheeky in, in putting it to you. Do you. Does this motto ring a bell? But but it does ring a bell, I think. It did practice. ring a bell, but I, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, <laughs> I didn't get it. Sorry, uh, but but yes, uh, that is well, yeah, that uh, there you are. You see, uh, one of the oldest schools in the country, actually, indeed, from the 14th century. That's the right, the oldest school in the country. Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> well, let's continue with more questions. Uh, we have Ursula Pero from Amazon Investor Coalition. Her questions. Is there a joint effort to help indigenous communities to defend their territories against illegal mining or other illegal actions? The short answer to that is 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 yes. We have been assisting. Um, we have been assisting uh, indigenous organisations, uh, particularly in northern La Paz, um, Sipilap, in uh, in their response um, to 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 that as a threat. I think it's really important. Um, you know, this is this illegal mining and uh, 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 is one of the largest threats to the Amazon. Full stop. Um, not it's not exclusive to Bolivia in any way. It, it's a real problem in Peru, in Colombia, in Brazil, in Ecuador. Um, it's a huge challenge. There are a number of different organizations and institutions working on this. We are a member of 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 a. Of an, in, of an interinstitutional collaboration or platform to look at this. But as we all know, there is, it's not an easy, it's, it's, it's a huge challenge, right? And so we are working with the national government. We are working with the local people, especially the indigenous people. We're also um, uh, working to generate information about this threat. Um, but I'm. I would. It, 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 I. You know. I would be fibbing or, or 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 if I didn't say that it's a. It is. It is definitely a major challenge into the future. Do we have more questions? I have a final question. If okay. I may. And it's this, this the importance of maybe the decentralization of cities and the promotion of intermediate towns that will engage with local communities. Yeah. 
and offer development and offer opportunities that requires schooling, it requires municipal development, requires creating infrastructure, et cetera, in these intermediate towns. I think that would help decentralizing big cities, uh, uh, which are under threat. I mean, the cities like La Paz, uh, you know, and El Alto, which got a, a, a population of two million combined, you know. So what yeah. are your views regarding that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's, you know, on the one hand, right, you think about urbanization and you think about what's actually happening. And what's happening is huge numbers of people are moving out of the countryside and into cities, which presents its own challenges from the perspective of the cities, of course, in terms of infrastructure and urban planning. Um, that's a whole nother, you know, that's a whole nother area, which we're not really engaged with that. Um, but I, it, but I totally recognize that that is, that is a, that is a major, major issue into the future for many places. And you think about, okay, so if lots of people are leaving the countryside and, and they're moving to cities, then surely that's, you know, that's a great thing for, 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 for sort of, you know, nature and biodiversity and, and the answer is not really. I mean, yes, to a certain degree, but also, you know, one of the, one of the issues and one of the reasons that we're working with, uh, you know, helping the indigenous organisations in in their kind of you know in their efforts to engage with young people in the indigenous territories, is because one of the one of the concerns that they have is that lots of the young people are looking to move to towns. They're not necessarily looking to move to La Paz, although some of them do, of course, but they are looking to maybe move to some of those intermediate towns that you've been talking about. And so then the question is, well, then if, you know, what's going to happen into the future in terms of the communities themselves and their actions to defend those places, right? And so, and so you know, it's a complicated situation. And so from the on the one hand, from the perspective of the landscapes themselves, it's not like, you know, it's not like the objective by any means, it certainly isn't, is that those those places should be devoid of people, no way. They are part of the landscape, they are part of the story and they're part of the history. And so we have to think about how to retain that 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 those populations that are committed towards the conservation of those places. I think that's important. Then, of course, there's the whole other side of it, which is, you know, what I was talking about at the end there, which is, you know, all of the political decisions about these places are made by everybody and the majority of everybody live in cities. And so we absolutely have to think we have to develop ways to engage with those people. One of the reasons I absolutely love the City Nature Challenge is because every year I get to spend four days with loads of people who are really interested in nature and we all get together and it is a celebration of nature and biodiversity. And you see that there are people who are committed to it. And I get comments from, you know, I didn't talk about it because I, you know, I ran out of time and I realized I wouldn't have time, but the city nature challenge, just to give you an idea this year, there were about a hundred institutions involved in it in La Paz between schools, universities, um, citizen groups, environmental groups in the city. And I love it because those la that latter group have said to me that having engaged with it and participate participated in it, their membership has gone up. And so I think that's something, that's another reason to be hopeful because we absolutely have to engage with that audience. And we have to encourage urban people to recognise. So, for example, La Paz, Cotapata National Park is about an hour and 15 minutes away from my house. I live in this, I'm here down, I'm in Cota Cota, which is the other side of La Paz. But there are parts of La Paz where it's half an hour away. And it's a national park. People can go there and visit. And I think we need to encourage that into the future because that's what's going to help these places in the long term, having that kind of general support from, from everybody. Thank you, Robert. I think if we do not have more questions, we are ready to close. Very good. Oh, no, let's yeah. wait a minute. We have another one. Yeah, uh, more last okay. one. Last one. What scope is there to introduce citizenship education into a school curriculum, curriculum to get engagement of young people to initiate local action projects? 
Yeah, it's a great question. So we, within the framework of the stuff we did with um, Identidad Madidi, uh, in, with Identidad Madidi, we, we had a couple of people in the schools of La Paz and El Alto visiting most of the high schools in both those cities to share the results. And then that's actually how we got into City Nature Challenge because, because I saw a presentation on that at a citizen science conference in Mexico. And I just realized immediately that's what we have to do next. That's how we carry this on. Um, and within the framework of those two activities, we've actually been in, we've been collaborating and coordinating with the Ministry of Education. And we've actually just this year signed a formal agreement with them to explore ways to do exactly what you're suggesting there, which is how do we get this information about Madidi, about Bolivian wildlife, about about uh, the Llanos de Mojos, the archaeology, all of these things into more formally into the curriculum. And so we will be doing that um, over the next couple of years. And, you know, what WCS can do is one thing. The important thing is that the, the ministry is very much um, open towards receiving information from all sorts of different actors such that we can improve um, the, the content of the curriculum and, and bring these these uh, stories to the fore. Thank you, Robert. Winston, I think we are ready to close. Very good. Well, Robert, um, we're delighted. I mean, it's been a, just uh, um, an amazing presentation. Uh, I think, you know, you've just, uh, as I said at uh, my first intervention, you've introduced us into a new universe, into a new metaverse, if you'd like to say it in, uh, in a more technical way. And we really appreciate the um, uh, you sharing uh, this with with us, and we will we will follow up, no doubt, in our own in our personal lives, and also in our work, uh, uh, researching uh, and exploring the things that you put forward. Thank you very much, Robert. Very we're very grateful for your presentation today. Thank you, Robert. I think we uh, just hearing these stories, that kind of projects that took us to different worlds, that were just really close to us. I think those stories highlight the need to public policy to support such holistic conservation strategies, ensuring they remain scalable and sustainable. By raising awareness and um, prioritizing education, we can drive meaningful change and protect our ecosystems to future generations. Robert, some last words? Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, it's uh, it's very strange to be presenting in English, <laughs> but, uh, but I think I managed to avoid um, <laughs> avoid slipping into Spanish too much. But thank you, thank you so much for the for the opportunity. It, it, it's it's always it's always nice to share um, stories. And thank you for the questions, the great questions and the, and the reactions. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, uh, for your invaluable insights. And uh, thanks to everyone for your participation. Have a great day.